All right. Well, let me begin by just saying that it is absolutely wonderful to have you with us. And I, there's like three groups I want to welcome. I want to welcome you who are in the room with me. I want to welcome you on any of our campuses. Thank you for being here. And I want to welcome our online community. And uh, that's kind of local and all around the world. And it's just absolutely wonderful to be here and uh, have you. And I want, to, I want to say this, and I specifically want to say this to those of you who are watching this online, whether you are local online or whether you are uh, national or international online, if you are in the neighborhood, if you live anywhere around any of our campuses, I want you to know we want you to come back. And more and more people are coming back every single week. We are setting brand new records in our church, post-corona records. <laughs> just disestablish that. But it's going up and up and up. And um, again, I just say we're having a good time. And whenever I'm somewhere and I'm having a good time, I want my friends with me. So I've got to say that. All right. So anyway, also, before I get going, there's two things I want to comment on. I love the fact that... Um, and again, I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this now, months, that uh, every, every single uh, service we, we pray uh, for our country. And if you listen to the prayers, we're praying for the pandemic, we're praying for uh, the unity within our country, uh, all kinds of, you know, uh, we have all kinds of division. Uh, we've talked about this with the coming election, you know, the storm's brewing. Uh, we deeply need prayer. And I want you to make sure that you understand we, we dedicate time in every service that we gather together to make sure that we, we ask God to bless. And so don't, don't just see that as just you know, something to do. It's, it's very intentional. And the second thing I want to say before I get started is I just I love our worship. And I'm, uh, I'm on the Gilbert campus right now as I'm saying these words. And uh, we were just incredibly blessed. But I know you also were blessed on the campus you were on. So wherever you are, would you just make some noise for the worship team and all the hours that they put in? Because uh, they, are, they are simply awesome. And I'll tell you what, I know these people, I know them personally, and uh, they are the real deal, and they love Jesus, and I, it's, it's not a show, it's their heart. Okay, so let's get going here. Um, I want to read a passage of scripture that you might be familiar with, but it seems so incredibly timely and so apropos to the, the world that we're now living in. It's from the, uh, kind of the introduction to the book of James, and uh, it, it's in the first chapter, it's in the first couple of verses, but he says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Uh, wow. So, so somehow when it's really messed up, when life is really hard, when we're really pressed and we're, we're put into trials, we're actually supposed to say thank you. We're actually supposed to see this as a good thing. Now, I know this is not our, our a natural disposition. I, I get this. We, we want to complain and we want to whine and we want to think about how hard it is. But God says, I, I can do something in your life in times like this that I can't do any other time. Uh, I can shape you. So we're in a series right now that we started last week that we're going to continue for a few weeks to come. It's called Foundations. All right. And so we're just talking about well, actually, what we're talking about is this simple idea about how to have a faith. Okay, so how do you build a faith that endures? Now, now again, tragically, and, and this breaks my heart to say this, but I, I would be disingenuous to not say this. I, I know that this pandemic and uh, all the kind of the issues that are going on in the country have really spun some people out. I mean, literally spun them out. And, and basically, uh, I know people that have just walked away from the faith. They said, if there was a God, this could never happen which is totally contrary to what we just read, but that's the conclusion they've reached, which, which just simply means the faith that they had wasn't substantial enough to endure what we're all going through. Now, everyone on the planet is going through this, okay? But in, in our unique you know, environment in, in Arizona, in the United States at this time, there's just pressure. And all the reasons I just said why we pray every week about it. It's just, it's a tough, tough time. But if faith wasn't made for a time like this, why have faith at all? This is like the, the, this is the, the, the glorious moment for your faith to shine. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So to say these, teams, these times are trying is an understatement. To say that God can do incredible things in this time is also an understatement. Now, I want to remind you of what we talked about last week, just so we can get going. Okay, so last week we talked about the idea of not borrowing your faith, but actually owning your faith. We talked about borrowed faith is faith that was handed over or down to you from someone. It could be handed over from a spouse, it could be handed over from a boyfriend, a girlfriend, it could be handed over uh, from a pastor. Uh, borrowed faith is somebody else's faith you just stuck onto your life. It's not really yours, and you know it's not yours, it's theirs, and you're using it, and you're calling it good. Owned faith is, is that which you have actually questioned, that which you have actually processed, that which 
You, you've checked out. You've, the difference is you engaged to get faith that you own. It, it took some mental work. Because there's just objections that we'll all have when it comes to understanding the call of Jesus on our life. We're going to have objections, and you have to work through those for you to have the kind of faith that actually goes deep. And, and so we're just wrestling with this, all right? Um, we want a faith that will serve us well. We want a faith that will last, that will bear through it all. So last week I showed you this verse, this, just again by way of review. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. I, I didn't say that. I didn't make that up. That's scripture. That's God saying, hey, you. Hey, you, you over there, you check it, do some work, think through some stuff, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. How are you going to know you fail if you don't test yourself? He says test yourself. So last week we identified six plausible tests that we could put ourselves through, that we could ask ourselves some hard questions. All right. And, and, and again, I, I don't like tests anymore and you like tests, but scripture says test ourselves. So, so we ask the question, the six things that we could question about ourselves. Do I passionately pursue Jesus? That would be a test to know whether or not my faith is mine or it's somebody else's. I'm just living it through, uh, out through them. Uh, do I serve others with my life? Is my life all about me or is there room for others? All right. Uh, do I tell others about Jesus or is this just like, hey, this is mum's the word. I don't want to be identified. I don't want anyone to know. So I'm going to keep it on the down low. Uh, live in community with others. Do I live in community with others? Not am I in a commune, but am I an island unto myself? Or do I invite other people into my life? And, and if I have a burden, do I have friends that I can actually call on in the faith who would help carry me through a, a, a difficult time? Uh, fifthly, do I give generously or all my resources about me? And uh, sixthly, do I worship regularly? Is, is worship a priority? All right. So. What we're going to do is we're going to take these questions and we're just going to test ourselves through the weeks to come. That's what we're going to do. All right. So we're going to start today with passionately pursue Jesus. But here's what I need you to do. Take your Bible out and find Mark chapter five. Just take your Bible, find Mark chapter five. And I'll just give you a general hint right now. It's in the it's in the last third of your Bible. Uh, it'll be the second book in what's called the New Testament, which we uh, we talked a little bit about how to understand all that. I'll go, I'll go a little bit more into it in a moment. The title uh, for the message today uh, in Mark 5 is simply Passionately Pursue Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to test ourselves. How passionate am I about this? All right. So while well, you're finding Mark 5, and I hope that you, you got there. And again, I'll, I want to explain something to you about the gospel of Mark in just a minute. So I'll hold that until I get there. But second book in the New Testament. Um, we're going to talk about passion. I want to give you a definition of passion. I just pulled this off dictionary.com. A strong or extravagant fondness, enthusiasm, or, or a desire for something, the object of such fondness or desire. Now, there's all kinds of applications of passion, all right? But a strong or extravagant fondness, an enthusiasm, a desire for something, or the object of that desire. I want to, um, I want to take you back to the year 1997. I want to take you to a, a speech that was given at the Executives, uh, the Executives Club of Chicago it was given by the then CEO uh, of Coca-Cola. His, his name was Roberto Goizueda. And he gave a speech that just rocked the house, all right? And uh, I want to just take a little excerpt of his speech, and I'm going to tell you what he said. CEO of Coca-Cola, all right? He said this, a billion hours ago, human life appeared on Earth. A billion minutes ago, Christianity emerged. A billion seconds ago, the Beatles performed on the Ed Sullivan Show. A billion Coca-Colas ago was yesterday morning. And the question we're asking ourselves around Coke is, what must we do to make a billion Coca-Colas ago be this morning? Now, do you understand what he said? Our goal is we've got to sell more Coke. And, and we've got to figure out how to make this thing. And then he, he, this, he said this quote. At the end of every day of every year, two things remain unshakable, our constancy of purpose and our continuous discontent with the immediate present. We've got to find a way to sell more Coke. Now, I, I, I don't mind Coke. I'm not, I'm not uh, 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 preferred over Pepsi. That's my personal preference, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm not like, I don't live my life for Coke. Most of us in, in any of our rooms 
You don't live your life for Coke. Could you actually give your life, though, to the mission of selling more people more sugared water? Because essence of Coke, sugared water. Is it worth living for? Is it worth dying for? Is it worth your life? See, that's what passion does, it, is it connects you with something that you're going to give yourself to, to that thing that you go, it is so worthy of me and all I've got. And for Roberto Gorsueda, it was Coca-Cola, all right? Now, I don't know what it is that you get passionate about, but I can tell you whatever it is you're chasing is probably your passion. Now, you can put that in any context you want to put it in, but what you are passionate about, you do pursue. You chase after it. Passion is about intention. It, it, is, a, it, it is about effort that you're expending to accomplish something to take you somewhere. Um, being passionate is the opposite of being passive. Passionate means, no, I'm going for it. Passive means, eh. And so you could never say, I'm passively pursuing something. It makes no sense. I'm passively, yeah, you going to college? Yeah, yeah, how, how's it going? Oh, I'm passively pursuing a degree. <laughs> how long has it taken you? Uh, wow, I'm 59. Uh, pa you, you don't passively pursue, you passionately pursue. And as I'm just telling you, whatever you're pursuing, you're, my guess is it's got your passion. Now, all kinds of things can be pursued. Obviously, people can pursue, uh, you know, with passion. They can pursue things you know, within their family. Uh, they can pursue things in their career. You can pursue things about your health. You can pursue things about, well, and, and like I was joking with some people at the door, uh, walking in this building. Uh, you know, one of the things we identify with passion so much is our sports team. There are more Green Bay fans in this room right now. Than, than, oh, yeah, there they are. Okay. <laughs> There they are. I, I just, and we have all kinds of sports fans because I saw your jerseys as you're walking in, all right? We're passionate. Sports is often a thing that we're really, really passionate about. And, and obviously, people also become very passionate about their politics, all right? So all of these things we, are, are potential points of passion. But you know what you're probably most passionate about of all? Your hobby, whatever that is. That's where people just, their passion just oozes out in their hobbies, whatever your hobbies are. I, I can't list all the hobbies that people have, obviously, but whatever it is, it could be running, hiking, skiing, biking, golfing, fishing, if you're really cool, uh, hunting. Um, you, you can go garage selling as a passion. That's another form of hunting, by the way, just so you know. Um, you shopping or cooking or doing home decor or binge watching Netflix can be your passion. It could be anything. But whatever you have passion for, you're setting aside time and you're setting aside a part of your heart. So what is it you're passionate about? And, and again, I, I've said this, I, I need to make sure you see this point. This is crucial. Whatever you are passionate about, you will indeed pursue. If you don't pursue it, you're truly not passionate about it. The, the two have to go together. Let me, let me ask you a question though. Have you ever wanted something and you want it so bad, you're so passionate, about it, I just gotta have it. And then, um, like actually a, a acquired it, attained it, reached it, you know, accomplished it, whatever. And as soon as you got it, you just had like second thoughts about the pursuit of it. And, and my guess is all of us have done this. We've all gone after something that we thought, man, this would be the difference maker in our life. This would be the, it'll set everything apart. It'll change everything. So we go after it with everything we've got. We get it. And then we just like, why did I, like, I, I don't know why I cared so much. It's like, I, it, I'm, I've just expected more from it than this. I want to show you a really quick video. I'm going to preface this by telling you it's a horribly made video, all right? So don't expect any quality in this video. Wherever you are, we've got it in a form where you'll be able to understand what's actually happening, and I'll describe you what's actually happening. I, in my own personal life, have never been to a Greyhound race, just to, as a disclaimer, okay? I don't, I don't bet on the docks, just so you know, all right? But I understand the concept of Greyhound race, and as most of us do. But what a lot of people don't understand is a dog is not like a horse. A horse has a guy on its back motivating it to run. It's called a jockey. You don't put a jockey on the back of a, a greyhound. So you have to do something to motivate the dogs. Well, what they do is they have a mechanical rabbit, all right? Now, if you've ever seen a rabbit, the rabbit is, is this furry ball of cotton that is attached to a rail that's on the inside of the track. So they release the rabbit the dogs see the rabbit, they're chasing the rabbit. That's their motivation to run. 
and they run the speed of the rabbit faster than the, the capacity of the dog, so the dogs can never catch up to it, but they chase it. That's the motivation of a greyhound race. And, and you go out with everything you've got because there's not a chance you're going to catch it, but what happens if you actually do? I want to show you what happens. Watch this. Racing go on happily inside of it. Slow to begin showing pace. Baron Samiti goes to the early lead. Jersey boy up to a clear second. Then came fast. Bond on the rails was go wild hope. Around the outside, Polly Princess from Small Presence. So oh, they've caught the lure here off the back straight. And uh, this will be a no race for sure and certain. They've grabbed the lure. I'm not sure what's happened there, but they've grabbed the lure off the back straight. So it'll be a no race for sure. We'll wait for confirmation from the stewards. But I don't think there's much uh, question. I'm not sure if you understand what just happened, but the rabbit broke and uh, it slowed down and the docs caught the rabbit and the docs stopped racing because the motivation's over once you get the rabbit. They, they never got the rabbit. But can you imagine the conversation between the dogs? They're going, hey, this thing is fake. I, how many years of my life have I given to catching this? It's fake. And uh, you know, you also, dogs are like going, what, now what am I gonna do? Are you going to chase after that once you caught it? Is any of those dogs good for racing anymore? I have no idea, but my guess is probably not. Because once you've been disillusioned with getting what you were chasing, you're like, this, there's no point to this whatsoever. But people do it. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Our hobbies become our passions. Our passions become our pursuits. And I catch what I'm about to say, and I don't mean to be dark or gloomy, but this is a reality. Most all of our passions die with us at our death. I, I, I mean, I'd be like a bummer, but, but our, our, our passions have no more life than our existence. Once we die, our passions die. Roberto Guisueda, CEO of Coke, gave that speech. Two months later, he was dead. He was dead. I wonder three months later, does he regret giving his life to something that had such a short life? In, in, in him? All of our passions are gonna die with us when we die, but the question I wanna wrestle with is do they have to? Could you actually give your life to something that outlives your life, that's bigger than your life, that's more than your life? That to me would be a significant thing. So we're gonna jump into Mark chapter five, and I wanna to explain to you two things about Mark that I just, like again, bring your Bible, bring your Bible, all right? But I told you last week that the, the New Testament is the first, uh, the Old Testament is the first two thirds of your Bible. The last one third of your Bible is the New Testament. The Old Testament is all about the sacrificial system. If you want to understand it, hit Leviticus, and knock yourself out, okay? Because it, it's very detailed, all right? Sacrificing animals for the for forgiveness of sin. The New Testament begins with the birth of Christ and goes through the life of Christ and then what are called the letters uh, that are like uh, the teachings of, of Jesus as people understood them. And there's a lot more to that. I'm, that's really brief. But here, here it ends with the book of Revelation, which is this is what you can anticipate. Now, what I need you to understand, as I told you last week, is there are four that didn't come up. There, there, are four, uh, there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four guys telling you the story of Jesus. So you begin the New Testament with four biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the, the, the thing you need to understand is different than my fingers. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Mark looks like it's the biggest one, right? Mark, it, except it's the littlest one. That's what you need to understand. The Gospel of Mark was the first of the Gospels written. It's briefest. It's the shortest. It's the most concise. It moves very quickly. In fact, if you want to do, do something interesting, see how many times the word immediately is used in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is just moving it. It's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. He's trying to get it out. Okay, so the, the Gospel of Mark just tells you like the sketches of the details. Now, often what you do is you go to the other Gospels and you can fill in some blanks. You, you can go, oh, I see, okay, all right. And when you put all the Gospels together, you get a pretty complete story of exactly what event you're reading about. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna read together Mark chapter five, verses 21 to 36. And like we do, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take it chunk by chunk so we can follow and we can track what's going on and, and it should make some sense. Now. In the passage we're gonna read, 21 to 36, you're gonna meet two people. And you wanna key in on these two people. They're as different as they can possibly be. One is a man, and the other one's gonna be a woman. 
One is very socially elevated, has status. The other one is very socially not elevated, has no status, exactly the opposite. But they have one huge thing in common. They have a passion to pursue Jesus. And I want to show you what it looks like in the lives of these two people. So let's jump in. We're going to go to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 36. Uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, no, the 21 to 24. We're going to just catch the first of the story, all right? So here's what happens, all right? This is how it starts. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, this is the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret. It's that, that fresh body water that's central in Israel. Or it's kind of northern Israel. Um, but it, it crossed over the boat to the other side of the lake. A large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. So, so they see him coming on a boat and a crowd starts to gather because Jesus is coming. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And live. So, so Jesus went with him. Okay, so here we meet the first of the two. We meet the man named Jairus, all right? And, and we discover that he's a synagogue leader. To be a synagogue leader, a high social status, all right? This is a Jewish nation. He's a Jewish leader. Um, I need you to understand that he was waiting for Jesus, literally. He was waiting to see where the boat's going to land so that he can get there right away because he's got a pressing need he needs Jesus' help with. And, and so he runs up to Jesus, and you saw it. It says he fell at his feet. Now, let me explain. He groveled. He humiliated himself. He humbled himself. He literally went down. A total act of desperation because he has an urgent issue that he needs Jesus' help with. And what was the issue? He said, my little daughter is dying. His daughter was ill, all right? Now, most believe that the daughter was around age 12, all right? Just so you can have that in the back of your mind. But there's two things you've got to understand. And I don't like saying what I'm about to say, but if you don't understand this, you don't... You know, in the culture of the day... To be a child carried no status whatsoever, and to be a female carried less status than being a male. So there's a child who's a female who's dying. Now, if you're Jesus and you're going to walk through the, okay, I've got to organize my priorities and give my priorities to the most important, da, 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 a child who's a female would not be the top of your list of what you're doing. Uh, you just didn't have much clout. It's not worth my time. But... I want you to see five words. So Jesus went with him. You want to know the heart of Jesus? You want to know what moves the heart of Jesus? Listen to me, church. Passionate people passionately pursuing him gets his attention. So Jesus, he's a synagogue, this synagogue ruler is important, but his daughter's not. But the passion? Oh, oh, that caught his, caught his eye. So Jesus went with him. Now, can you just imagine the relief of Jairus? Like, of all these people, you're going to come with me? Like, that's the greatest news you could have. And, 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 and can you imagine the urgency? Please come, let's go now. As fast as they can get through the crowd, he wants to move. He's got stuff to do. And you can also imagine, well, there's, there's a crowd. We, we learned that. There's a crowd. You can imagine, you know, the, the disciples might be walking ahead. Step aside, step aside. And people are kind of, you know, you know, kind of making way, but they're kind of following. It's kind of like a golf tournament. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, come on, clear out, clear out. And so they, as soon as Jesus and Jairus walk by, people are pressing back in, you know, trying to get near. All right. So that's what's going on. But I want to show you the next section, which is verses 25 to 29. And we're just working our way down the story. And it says this, um, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. There's your golf crowd. All right. There's the gallery. And a woman was there, all right, now this is the second character, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So now we meet the second person, okay? The first guy was a man named Jairus. The second player is a woman 
named Jane. So this is the text of Jane and Jairus, Jairus and Jane. And you go, Jane, where did you get Jane? Yeah, her name's Jane, Jane Doe. Uh, we don't know her name, so we're gonna give her a name. We're gonna call her Jane Doe. What you gotta understand is nobody knows who she is. Nobody in the crowd has any idea who this woman is. They, they're not like, hey, Sylvia, stop that. No, she's on her own. Uh, most scholars believe she came from Caesarea Philippi, which is in the Golan Heights, if you're familiar with Israel, it's the base of Mount Hermon. It's up there. It's where the Jordan River begins. She's now down in Capernaum, where Jesus is, Sea of Galilee. She traveled because she heard that there was a guy in Capernaum who could, who could heal you of, of things that others couldn't heal you of. And so she comes. And, and what I need you to understand is, and this is, what you, this is not intuitive, but I need you to see this, right? She has two problems. She has two issues, all right? She has a physical issue, and she has a spiritual issue. Now, you're not just going to figure this out, so you've got to pay attention so I can explain this to you, all right? Now, the physical issue is easier to understand. She was hemorrhaging blood. M most scholars who have studied this believe that she probably first started hemorrhaging blood when she started puberty, which they would uh, uh, assign somewhere around the age of 12. So she's, she's bleeding constantly, probably has had this thing from the time she was 12. We know she's been bleeding for 12 years. That makes her about 24, 25. The average lifespan in that day was about 40 years. So most of her life now, she you know, has been, uh, most of her adult life, she, she's had this issue uh, I mean, all of her adult life, but a lot, most of her life in, in total, she's probably 24, 25. She's been suffering with this, all right? And um, so she's got this problem, and uh, it just happens, just don't miss this. It happens to be uh, the same age as Jairus' daughter is old, uh, which means that when Jairus' daughter was born, it was about the time that this woman probably started this if she's had it for 12 years. So just connect those dots because they kind of seem interesting. Now, it says that uh, she had sought the help of many doctors. Now, they're not anti-doctor, we're not anti-doctor, uh, but here's the deal. It, it's usually what we do first, right? Well, I got, I'm, I'm sick. The first thing I got to do is I got to go to a doctor, and I'm not anti-doctor, all right? But she went to a doctor, and then she went to another doctor, and she went to every doctor she could go to, and it says that no doctor could heal her. In fact, it says they actually made her case worse. Did you read it? it? It actually compounded her problem, because number one, they didn't heal her, and number two, they took away all of her resources. She spent everything she had. She had nothing left. And she still got the problem. And maybe some of the stuff they told her to do actually made it worse, I don't know. But she's at a point of desperation because she's not getting better. Now, that's her physical problem. Now, um, I want to show you what her spiritual problem is. And um, I'm going to put your seatbelt on. Because I want to show you something the Bible says that just going to shock you. Because you go, I didn't know the Bible said that. But um, remember that book I was telling you about? Leviticus and what you do if you got... Well, let me show you from the book of Leviticus. When a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period, or as a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge. Just as in the days of her period. Did you know the Bible talks about your period, ladies? Most of us go, had no idea it was that intimate of a book. It is. And it's very clear. When you're on your period, there's in this old covenant, old covenant, all right, there's this time of uncleanness. And, and, and uh, so this lady, she's going to, She's unclean while she's bleeding. Now, I want to just take you a little bit further down in the book. A couple of verses later, catch this part. When she is cleansed from her discharge, she must count off seven days. And after that, she will be ceremonially clean. What happens when you don't stop bleeding? You are perpetually unclean. What does it matter if you're perpetually unclean? Two things. You don't go into the temple, which means you have no access to where God is in the old covenant. And people know to stay away from you. Because if they touch you, they're, they're unclean from you. She is like a leper. She is treated dishonorably because of this issue of blood that she's had for 12 years. And so she's got a huge issue. And um, she, she comes up with this idea. If I could just possibly reach out and just touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. If I could just reach him. I, I know 
I could be healed. In fact, did you see what she was saying? If I can touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I can touch his clothes, I will be healed. She repeated that. If I could touch his clothes, I could be healed. Who's she talking to? Who's she talking to? She has no friends in the crowd. Nobody knows who she is. You just get a woman, just if I could just touch his clothes, if I could just, I could be healed. If I could just touch his clothes, I could be, if I could, she's talking to herself, trying to get in. So she goes for it. She touches the garment of Jesus and immediately she was healed. Wow. And immediately catch it. She knew she was healed. She knew she was healed. Let me show you what happens next. Chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You, you see, the people crowding against you, his disciples answer, and yet you ask who touched me? This is funny. Jesus stops, he's in a crowd, and he's got all the people around him, and he just stops, which you got to picture people just, he turns around and he goes, okay, who touched me? And, and uh, uh, I think it's Luke tells us, it was Peter. Peter goes, are you, are you crazy? Are you crazy, dude? Who do you mean who touched you? What do you, everyone, everyone. And Jesus knows the difference between an inadvertent touch and an intentional reach. He stops and he's looking around. I need you to understand something. Don't miss this. Jesus is omniscient. I mean, he turns around and immediately he knows who it was. He's not, I need some information here because I'm clueless. He knows exactly who touched him. And he's looking and he says, who, who touched me? Why does he do this? Because she wants to just be as distant and as an anonymous and she just wants to just do it and then be like, just drift away. And Jesus goes, no. Who touched me? And she's going, oh my word, oh my word, he knows, he knows. And then Jesus just stops and he's just looking around. And again, I know he, I know he, knew, he didn't knew. And she's got this moment of crisis of, with her faith. Do I, do I own it? Do I admit it? Do I? And so she steps forward and she says, um, it, was, it was me. And um, you got to understand, look, look at the, uh, go to 532 and 34. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, how dare you? How dare you touch me? Oh, wait, no, that's, that's another. That, no, that's not this story. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. What an incredible moment. You get the feeling that Jesus wants her, don't miss it, to step out, step up, own it. Own it. She goes, I, I did. And she literally is now scared to death. He's going to condemn her. He's going to condemn her. And uh, he looks at her and he says a word that she had probably not ever heard in her life or it's been a long time. He said, daughter. Now, you might be wondering what this is about. This is a painting, uh, uh, it's a, uh, I don't have the right term, don't, you artists among us, forgive me, I don't know the right, it's a, it's a reprint of, it's not a painting, it's a, this is a mural on a wall in Magdala, Israel. Magdala is on the coast of, it's, so Capernaum is up here north, Magdala is a little bit over on this side over here, and um, have you ever heard of Mary Magdalene? M Mary from Magdala. So in Magdala, they have a, a chapel that is dedicated to Jesus' love for women and all pure and chaste, all right? But his love for women and the difference he made in the lives of women. And painted on the wall is this um, mural. Uh, it's massive, it's massive. And we were there and my wife goes, I've got to have that. So, um, so we, we, we bought the print and had it framed and it hangs in our house. But this right here is what I want to draw your attention to. And you just want you to see this hand reaching out. And I want you to see this little touch of light. 
if you can see it, and I know again, wherever you are, it's probably hard, but try your best. It's the woman, don't miss it, on her knees, just trying to fight through the crowd, just to reach, just to touch, and uh, totally anonymous. People have no idea she's even there. Nobody cares about her, but she knows who he is. If I could just touch. And then he stops, he turns around, and he says, who touched me? She went, we, we saw that. And she's like going, oh, no, he's going to condemn me. That's what you need to understand. You don't touch a man if you're a woman and he is not your husband. And furthermore, you never touch a rabbi if you're a woman. You don't touch a rabbi. And all he's got to do is point her out, say, that woman, and she is condemned. But he doesn't do that. He goes, daughter, daughter. I don't know if you know this, he's a king. What does that make her? Hey, hey, princess, hey, princess, it's okay. He says, your faith, it's healed you. You're well. Now go, go. He healed her, he forgave her, he set her free. He gave her life, he gave her a name, he gave her, oh, daughter. Wow. Um, okay, I got to finish the pack. I got to get done. Last part. So this is what you got to understand. So Jairus is like, uh, hello, my daughter. See what's going on here? My daughter over here. Remember, we're like urgently going to see my daughter. And Jesus stops. And you got to imagine Jairus is like going, come on, we don't have time for this. Do you understand what's happening to my daughter? Let's go. We got to go. And he's in a hurry. And he and she, she says, hang on. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Hey, uh, sorry, man, but your daughter is dead. And can you just imagine the heart falling out of Jairus's chest, just dropping? Just what? Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, uh, Jesus told them, hey, um, yeah, don't, uh, don't worry about that. Just believe. Now, I don't have time to keep going, but if you keep going, he's going to go, he's going to raise this girl from the dead. That's what Jesus does. He does things like that. And, and so she's going to be fine, just so you know. Okay, I don't, I don't have time to read it. But I want you to notice something. Two daughters. One who had spent 12 years living who was 12 years old and was dying, one who had spent 12 years dying and now was living. You want to know what the touch of Jesus will do when you passionately pursue him? He'll change your life. He will change your eternity if you'll but reach out and try to touch him. Now, I asked you a little bit earlier, and again, I've got to, I've just got to, I've got to be done here. So I'm going to do this very quickly. I asked you earlier, what, what does passion mean? Do you know where we get the word passion? It comes from the 12th century. You know where the word passion originated in Latin? Using, a, a, they need to come with a term to explain the, the drive of Jesus to go to the cross. That, like what would cause somebody, and, and the word passion in the original word always involved a willingness to suffer for something greater than yourself. And if, if you're familiar with Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, the crucifixion is referred to as the passion, the greatest motivation of Jesus. And I just need you to understand this. I, I, I want to take you real quickly. Luke 22, I want to take you to the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's going to be crucified. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He knows what it means to bleed. He knows what's going to happen to him tomorrow when he's crucified or very quickly at that point, a, a day from then. He knows this. His passion is dripping from his forehead. And then they take him and they, they crucify him. And, and they actually, before they crucified him, they mocked him. They beat him. They shoved the crown of thorns on his head to get his brow, brow to bleed again. And then they take him out and they, they crucify him. But you know this, they stick him on the cross and nail his hands and his feet. 
And you know what he has the audacity to say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Why, why would he do this? Why would he do this? All right, you ready? Don't miss it. Because you were worth it to him. You, you were worth dying for. You were worth dying for. And he had a choice to make. And he said, I'll make that choice. I'll give my life for your life. You were with it. Um, can I point out our problem? Our problem is not that just we are too passionate about unworthy things, but that we are not passionate enough about the one who is truly worthy of our passion. That's our problem. You know how the... 12 apostles died, these followers of Jesus. Well, one of them, John, died of old age, but you know how everyone else died? They were, they were killed for their faith. They were martyred. Hmm. Kind of makes you wonder if it, it's the big idea, if you haven't caught on yet, okay? If it's not worth dying for, it's certainly not worth living for. So when we're so passionate about our hobbies, our hobbies are going to die with us. They're just going to die with you. What if you became passionate about something that would live beyond you? Now, I don't know how intense your passion is or isn't for Jesus, but I want to remind you of the words of Paul, Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Oh, if I have to make a choice, you know, I just tough. A man, I'll, I'll live or I'll die. I'll, I'll go for it. Man, I, it doesn't matter. It's going to be about Jesus, and I'm going to serve him with everything I've got. In, in, in Philippians 2, he talks about, I press forward. I agonize. Philippians 3, I press forward. I, I strain for Jesus. When's the last time you've agonized? How far would you go? Would you be one in the crowd who let Jesus just walk by you, going, yeah, I hear he does great things. Or would you have the audacity to literally get down on your knees and go, Jesus, just, I need to touch. I need to touch. Many people let him walk right on by. I've got three quick challenges and one thing I want to read, and we'll be done. Challenge number one, why don't you make a decision? You want to get passionate? Make a decision and the arrangements to get baptized. We've got lots of people on all of our campuses today getting baptized. It's going to happen, I believe, on all of our campuses after the 1030 service. Hey, that might be you. You can maybe jump in on that. Um, when you're baptized, you're saying, I believe. I identify. I'm in. I, I, yes. That's one thing. How about this one? Second one. How about you read a chapter a day from the book of John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The John is the one that written latest. I told you that last week. It'll give you insight. A chapter a day. Just for 21 days. 21 days forms a habit. I should form a habit of reading the Bible. I could do that in the next 21 days. Third, why don't you ask somebody how you can pray for them and then commit to do so for seven days straight. You stick it on your refrigerator, stick it on your mirrors, do whatever you have to do on your dashboard of your car. But don't just pray for somebody. Ask them, can I pray for you? And what can I pray for you about? Or just go, I know you're, you know, I, I get emails from people. You know, my dad just died. I know, I know. I want you to know I'll pray for you. Something specific that you can do, all right? Now, here's the deal. Three challenges. Jesus can walk right by you, and you just don't even look up. Or you can go, I'm going to reach for him. So I want to close. I want to read you something. Uh, it's called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. Um, I don't know exactly who to attribute this to because there's some sort of like uncertainty about it. Most people believe this was written by a Rwandan Christian on the night before he was murdered. Now, if you know anything about the Rwandan, the Hutu and the Tutsis and the genocide, but that he penned these words and that he was executed the next day. But let me just close this message with these words. How passionate are you for Jesus? Let me read you his words. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow up, or back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, uh, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, chintzy giving, 
and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I now live by presence, lean by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are through, few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until heaven returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he does come to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. That's what passionately pursuing Jesus looks like. But it always starts with the humility to reach out and begin a journey. Pursue him. Let's pray. So, Father, uh, we could all heat up the passion, I'd imagine. I know I can. God, I need you to uh, just uh, fan the flame in all of us. Just fan the flame. God, at a time like we're going through as a country, what an incredible opportunity for you to do an amazing thing within us. And what an incredible opportunity for us to do an amazing thing in the world. But without passion, none of it's going to happen. If we give the best of our energy to our hobbies, our careers, or whatever, we're going to give what's left to you. May we reverse that. Give the best to you. And then what's left? The things that won't last. God, there is nothing worth living for more than you, and there is no one worth dying for more than you. Help us to see it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.